All righty. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's uh, social media feeds. We are live on YouTube, on Twitch, on Facebook, on Periscope, on Twitter. We're out there in the world, everybody. Hello, I'm talking here in the middle. My name is Patrick. I work at the aquarium here in social media. If anything breaks during this broadcast, it'll be my fault if we're suddenly streaming uh, invertebrates out in the bay. That's on me. So I'm here in the middle over to this. Oh, I'll never be able to see uh, this side of the screen. We've got the better half of the social media team. There's Emily over there. Uh, hey, Emily. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Or I should say, hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> good to see everyone here this oh, morning. Oh, that's a new one. This should be fantastic. Hello. And then all <laughs> around us here, uh, surrounding us, are amazing folks from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I've got Cassie over on that side, uh, Susan uh, right below me over here, and then we've got uh, George over in the corner um, right there. And uh, these folks are going to be answering your amazing questions in the chat live here and maybe even answering your questions here live on the stream. But I wanted to present to you all uh, our very, very special guest here today. We have a uh, special guest ROV pilot extraordinaire. Ben, you are live here on screen. We've got Ben Irwin, everybody. Uh, say hello to the to the fine folks online. Ben, how you doing? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm doing really well, Patrick. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. So uh, you're, it looks right now like you are at sea, um, but you've got some green screen trickery that you're going to be using for us today, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Got my green screen set up. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I'm going to try to remove all of the, the different Zoom uh, menus that I had up on screen uh, right there. But so just before we get started, before we talk to Ben, Ben is going to be guiding us on an amazing dive uh, <laughs> into. Oh, and we've got uh, <laughs> we've got a small child joining us. Hey. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, we are, of course, still um, streaming from our respective living rooms Uh while um while yeah while we're just closed for this pandemic that we're in but this brings us all together we're going to go on a dive into some deep sea tech here uh some really cool stuff here from ben but first let us introduce the monterey bay aquarium research institute and uh our colleagues over there i'm going to refer to them as Embari the rest of the time so Embari is an amazing, amazing facility that is located about 20 miles north here of the aquarium. And it is uh, right at the mouth of an amazing, amazing natural feature, which is the Monterey Submarine Canyon. You can see it here on this animation. We're in Monterey waving at Moss Landing over there. And right there at the head of that canyon is where Embari sits. And this Monterey Submarine Canyon is essentially like the Grand Canyon underwater. It's a mile deep from the rim of the canyon down to its deepest point, and there's another mile of water stacked up on top of it, which means that out at its deepest point, it's about two miles deep. You can see here fingers of that canyon extending out over towards Pebble Beach and Carmel, but going many, many miles, over 60 miles out to sea. And that's what Embari is up to with its uh, research a lot of the time. We have here the Rachel Carson in the Moss Landing Harbor. You can see there the power plant in the background. It's very iconic. You can see uh, from all around the bay. That's the Rachel Carson, one of the research vessels. And here is the research vessel, the Western Flyer, that we will be uh, we will be talking a lot about because on board the Western Flyer is Ben's uh, ROV, the one that he pilots uh, all the time. This is the ROV Doc Ricketts, uh, named for the John Steinbeck character and the famed biologist that lived here uh, along Cannery Row. And ROVs like this Doc Ricketts dive down into that deep sea with uh, loads of scientific equipment and the cameras that are going to be allowing us to, uh, that have allowed us to show you all of the amazing animal life that we've talked about in previous broadcasts here of Mysteries of the Deep. You can see there that ROV arm is moving around. The lights are on. It's piloted. That's what Ben is up to. And he is going to uh, be talking to us a little bit more about that. If I can nail this transition directly to you, Ben. So, Ben, there's your baby there up on screen there. Uh, ROV Doc Ricketts. And there it is behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about what your job is uh, at Embari and uh, that amazing piece of, of tech that you get to that you get to work with? Yeah, so the, well, this is uh, the Doc Ricketts vehicle. It's, um, 
It's called an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. Uh, Doc Ricketts is uh, rated to uh, 4,000 meters depth. So uh, that's just about uh, two and a half miles uh, deep we can go. Um, we have, uh, it, it's a electrohydraulic vehicle. So that means there's a big electric motor that turns a hydraulic pump, which uh, gives us uh, power to move the thrusters and the arms and, and other actuations on the vehicle, like the, the doors on the desampler and things like, things like that. Um, we have uh, fiber optics that go down an, an umbilical that attaches to the vehicle. So uh, that's what we use to transfer data from, from the vehicle to the ship <clears throat> in real time. And um, yeah, there's, I think there's six fibers right now. So that, that allows us to do HD video and, uh, and ethernet and things like that. And then we have uh, two big arms on the vehicle as well. Uh, see on my screen, you can see here, there's uh, with uh, uh, these two robotic arms. Uh, this one on the port side of the vehicle is a titanium arm uh, that we use. It's called sh the Schilling T4. And this arm is basically a very strong arm that can lift a lot of weight and, um, and do a lot of heavy work. But it's a little less dexterous than our craft one on this side, on the starboard side of the vehicle. Uh, this arm is a, uh, an, it's an aluminum arm. But it, it, it's, it's very dexterous and nimble. And we can do uh, lots of really fine detail work with that. So between the two arms, we, there's, there's not a lot we can't do um, uh, underwater. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've got uh, some video uh, going on in the background right now of um, the dock rickets, I believe, from when um, from your dive where you were filming each other, the ROV Ventana that we've talked about on this program before, and then oh, the yeah. dock rickets there um, together. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, uh, just before we go to the audience questions, which I'm sure there are many, many audience questions uh, out there, but Ben, can you tell us how does one get into this kind of, this kind of line of, line of work? How do you uh, get this, this type of job? Obviously, you've got a green screen going uh, for the Zoom <laughs> call and everything. So um, you've, you're used to wiring a whole bunch of different things together. But tell us a little bit about how uh, you pilot something like this and how you get into that kind of work. Well, sure. Um, well, my, my background is in uh, industrial elect uh, electricity. So basically, um, uh, an electrician. I, I have. Um, I just have an associate's degree from Long Beach City College, where I went to school. And um, I, when, while I was uh, at that school, I, I found uh, a robotics competition that was run by um, by MATE, which uh, which means the Marine Advanced Technology Education. I think is what it stands yep. for. Yep. But MATE MATE would set up these uh, these uh, competitions every year, and. Uh, uh, I fell in love with that with that concept of, of building a robot and competing under, uh, especially underwater. It added just this crazy dimension of challenge to it, and uh, we did uh, really well. Um, the one of the years I was there, and um, uh, I got an internship basically with um, Bob Ballard, who uh, is uh, who's uh, found the uh, Titanic wreck. I guess that's his his claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, so I spent two seasons out on their boat in the Mediterranean, um, cruising around looking at volcanoes and shipwrecks and stuff like that. And so I, I was hooked after that. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. So <laughs> that's awesome. So you got to go look for for sunken treasure with Bob Ballard from Titanic. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's awesome. It was great. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, here let me go to Emily real quick. Emily, let's go to the first few questions here for for Ben. Um, what, what do people want to know about, about your work? Well, first of all, a lot of people are really excited that you have had the chance to work with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, Mr. Ballard there. Uh, <laughs> so lots of people excited about that. Um, just like you, uh, but Ben, you're talking about this incredible instrument that we have to go down into the deep sea to record all of these amazing animals and the geology and everything down there with such a robust but kind of delicate piece of equipment. How do we keep it 
safe down there from all of those different elements. A lot of people are like, well, wouldn't it rust down there? What about the pressure down there? So how do you build a piece of equipment to withstand all the challenges that come with going to the deep sea? Oh, well, well, yeah, first things it's, it's not cheap. That's for sure. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 all these things come into play. And so, um, the materials we use on the vehicle are mostly aluminum uh, because aluminum has really great uh, corrosion, corrosion resistance. And so um, it's also very strong it's, it's, uh, and we can, it's easy to work with. So most of the frame on the vehicle is, is all aluminum. And then there are other processes we use to, to um, mitigate the corrosion even on the aluminum. Um, and so, um, the, the rest of it, like these housings here, I don't know if anybody can see these, but it's all, our one atmosphere housings that contain all the, the really um, delicate hardware, uh, like the fiber optics and uh, other computer boards and things like that, and power supplies, those, those can't see pressure. So they're in, they're in a uh, one atmosphere housing is what we call it. And those are typically made out of titanium. And it's just these big titanium tubes um, with all the electronics stuffed inside. And then we, we connect to those with, um, with really expensive cables and connectors that, uh, that can go off to these individual lights and cameras and things like that. And that's how we pass the signals around. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, everything is, uh, it's a, a, an order of magnitude more complex when you start adding uh, not only pressure, but uh, also waterproof, uh, making it waterproof because uh, yeah, typically electronics and, and water, uh, don't mix very well. So, <laughs> um, right. but there are other things we do, like, uh, we have pressure tolerant houses as well, uh, housings and what we'll do like for just general power distribution and signals and things like that. We'll, um, we'll put them in these pressure tolerant houses and fill it with oil. And so those, those actually see the 6,000 PSI that, uh, that you, uh, Kind of typical at 4,000 meters, and um, and so we crush that with with that with that much pressure. But they the the typically like wired doesn't care if you crush it. <laughs> so so uh, that's how we we um, we get uh, at least a, little, a couple a little bit cheaper uh, in some of the ways to to wire the, the vehicle up. <laughs> that's that's fascinating. Well, and especially um, yeah, I just wanted to. Just wanted to ask a, a little bit, a little bit more for for you, Ben. Um, that salt water, that drop of salt water on electronics, we've all like seen it on our phones or on you know it's like that particular uh, issue of salt water and just water in general and electronics is really difficult for just just about everything, but especially going into the deep sea where you have not only this medium that could fry everything. Um, but you also have the pressure and, and, and all of that stuff. Can you um, describe a little bit about what it's like to be, uh, to be someone working in uh, two worlds that seem uh, like just really at war with each other, with electronics and salt water? Um, because it's really something I think a lot of people don't think too much about is, you know, you can kind of send things up into space a little bit easier than you can send things into, into salt water, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the bigger problem in space is is heat buildup, or I think they, they it's it's hard for them to actually get cooling up there, even though it's super cold. There's mm -hmm. no not a lot of waste for the the heat to get pulled out. But anyway, uh, for us, it's uh, it's it's mostly yeah. The how do you how do you build a, a housing uh, and then seal it uh, so that um, so, so that uh, it can withstand uh, the pressure and the, 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 um, the water. And it's uh, basically there's, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of engineering involved as far as like understanding how uh, O-rings work and then how, and, and then there's like typically at, at some depth, the, like the, the pressure housings we have are just metal on metal. And so they, it's, it's machining, it's tolerancing, it, um, uh, the, the metal so that it's 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 like glass <laughs> and and basically the metal two the two metal halves clash together but uh, I, I don't know um, it's uh it's just a lot of work it takes a lot yeah. of uh, a lot of teamwork that's yeah I can imagine here let's let's go back uh, 
to the gallery view just to say hello to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for all of your questions. We're answering them uh, furiously, uh, but I'm going to go over to, uh, to Emily. Uh, Emily, what kind of questions do the folks have out there for everybody? Yeah, so Ben, when you're out there uh, studying the deep sea, uh, how long do those missions usually last? And what's the longest you've ever spent at sea before? Oh, man. Um, well, on, at Ambari, we, 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 do, um, we typically only do 12-hour days. And then the Western Flyer is really only um, large enough to do like 10-day trips, 12, maybe 12 max. Um, uh, but we typically do between five and seven days just, just to keep it nice and comfortable. Uh, and then we do 12 hour days. So we wake up at, uh, at six and then, uh, so we start the morning at 6 AM and, and, uh, we're on deck at six, usually by six thirty. So, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not too, too bad that way. The longest I've been out to sea is, I think it's, uh, was ba was Ballard. It was like fifty something days, which is whoa. Uh, it wasn't. Yeah, there's. I know guys have been out much longer than that. So, <laughs> but uh, it was. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun because we we're we we're still in the Mediterranean and and um, and so we got to stop at a lot of really cool ports. You know, along um, like in Sicily and Spain and all these other really interesting places. It was, Awesome. So the so this experience of of quarantine uh, probably very familiar to that amount of time spent at sea or just yeah yeah except you get you get internet that's so that's there you fun. go yeah <laughs> nice cool okay I'm gonna put uh, Emily back up on screen any more questions here for Ben yeah absolutely um, sorry zoom was telling me that i was still muted i was not zoom thank you very much yeah come, uh, on, come, on. <laughs> come on technology uh well speaking of the technology uh ben what does it actually take to operate the dock rickets um yeah quite a bit i mean and i can swatch sw swap over to another screen here in a sec but um there's there are sensors all over this thing so um we have we have sensors not only for science but also telemetry sensors that tell us uh, the state of the vehicle, so like voltage and the current we're drawing. Um, on the electrical side, the, there's the fiber optic uh, bandwidth and stuff like that that we can um, that we can monitor. There's the video signals. We have, I think we have 15 analog video channels, and then we have uh, we can do one, two, uh, three, about four HD uh, video channels now. And it's changing all the time. So now we're, we're even doing um, able to do 4K uh, um, and stuff like that. Uh, now that, that they're starting to develop these new, these new cameras and stuff. So um, yeah, there's a lot of technology involved. Um, like every every piece of equipment on here is is just like it's packed with sensors, packed with technology, and it's it, it's it's kind of mind mind bending to try and understand all of it sometimes but uh but yeah it's 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 outrageous and then that's just the vehicle side then there's the ship side so like i'll switch over to this 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 is a control room so um basically like uh that's that's my boss Knut, and he's uh he's sitting in the in the pilot's chair and he's he's got a joystick there and there's touch screens over here that uh he can use to turn lights on and off and stuff like that so there's a computer system top side that uh, we have to know about the software that drives all that stuff. Um, there's there's all the video signals and the switching, like how to send the video signal from this monitor to this this monitor, and then the <clears throat> data management stuff and the tracking and CTD stuff. It's all over the place. It's there's it's just uh, so much technology, but. Um, so it, this looks awesome, by the way, Ben. Uh, I mean, you know, we were talking about like deep sea tech weather weatherman status, uh, but I mean, look at that. That's awesome. <laughs> right here. Yeah, yeah. that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. So people Can are you... also really excited that it's the uh, brooding octopuses that are behind yeah. you. Oh, yeah. It's the perfect, uh, perfect <laughs> scene to capture there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is... Uh... 
uh, I think it was last year we were we were at this one. I think we were here earlier this year actually too. I think, but uh, yeah, we're doing uh, this device measures I think oxygen or something like that. So we're trying to get temperature and oxygen measurements near there near the the octopuses. Um, but yeah, all these screens we got like multi beam sonar here tells us how close to things we are. It's sort of like a, a sonogram like. Uh, um, and um, let's see, what's this one? This is a regular uh, uh, scanning sonar. So it's just does a swath, a beam swath every once in a while. Tells you uh, what's out. We get quite a bit of range on this one. So this one's a, like a, a short um, a short range, and this is a longer range. And then uh, vehicle telemetry right there. <laughs> that tells us uh, that the screen tells us where what everything on the vehicle is like, oil levels and voltage, and also the orientation, so how we're sitting in the water. And then um, we have tracking further down there, so that tells us where we are in the world and in relation to the ship. Here, but, I think, uh, here, Ben, stay right there and, and tell us a little bit about the octopus garden, because I just found the oh. octopus video, and so I'll play you uh, together with that. Oh, this is awesome. Oh. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to encounter those octopuses? Yeah, here, I'll, I'll do uh, one better. So uh, let's try this. You're going to do one? Oh. So we we did a, a model of, of the, one of the sites. This is so cool. So <laughs> yes. See, this was one of the ledges um, that was that we filmed. Um, and so there, out, out at the ridge, it's it's really kind of on a on a on a cliff. All these all these things. Um, like all these little vents and stuff so they're they're scattered all over the place and so they're you can see how they're just kind of congregated and, and there's venting all along these cracks like this and so so rickets would fly in sort of like around here <laughs> and then we'd we'd land on the ledge and our our butts kind of out there hanging in the wind um just floating and uh we'd, we'd kind of down thrust on the ledge and do all of our work, um, trying not to disturb them uh, too much. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, th this is this ledge is uh, we've done a lot of work on this particular ledge, so this is why we we were able to film this one. Um, now, can you? It, can... It's it's crazy. They're they're everywhere. For for like, I mean, there's like tens of thousands of them all over the place, and uh, it's hard to even say like how big the area is. It's um, because I mean, it's you're like in a dark room with a flashlight, and you're trying it's you're trying to put it together in your mind what the whole area looks like. So it's kind of tough. But um, yeah, it's mostly like cliffs and ledges that they're they're stashed on, and there's just thousands everywhere. It's cool. Wow. And can you tell us uh, a little bit about what exactly what type of wizardry you just pulled off there? Because that was something that we definitely wanted to talk to you about. Uh, one of oh. the titles here of the of the of this talk here is about VR and, um, and other things happening in the, in the deep sea. So I've got the video of the octopuses that you helped film there, uh, in, in the background. And then, ah. uh, but can you tell us, and uh, now that you're back up on full screen, tell us what, what is going on behind you there? What, what did you just do? Okay. So, uh, well, this is called, um, uh, um, uh, structure from motion reconstruction. So, um, or photogrammetry uh, is another term uh, used. But uh, basically what we do is we take the vehicle and film, film an area and get basically try and get as much coverage of it as we can. And then uh, I take that footage and take the, the screen grabs like one every 30 frames or so. And um, I'm, there's, there's software out there that you can load these frames into and it will will basically guess or estimate, it'll try and pixel match between two frames and say, okay, I think this pixel is this, in this place in space and it'll put a dot there. And it does that millions of times over. And, and so it creates basically a, what they call a sparse cloud. And, uh, and then you go through this process of cleaning up these sparse clouds and make a, make a dense cloud. So it's almost, it looks almost like this, but there's uh, it, it's all just points in space, and then it'll 
it'll connect the dots and create a kind of a skin and then the texture goes on the skin. And so that's what this is. Wow. That's how we make these, these 3d models. And it's all just about, uh, getting good coverage with the camera. And, um, and there's some other tricks involved with, with lighting when you're underwater. Um, it's, it's important because there's, uh, you have things like, um, detritus that can throw off the software. So there's some cleaning up and things to do with it, but, mm. uh, oops, so, oops. Long, long screen. How long how long uh, would it take to create that particular model? So this one actually didn't take very long. Um, let's see. There's another one I have here. And this website, by the way, is Sketchfab uh, for folks. Sketchfab.com. Who... Yeah, and uh, <laughs> they can they can find all these models, right? Sketchfab.com slash Ambari. Is That's that... right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And they're free to download for anybody. You can you can pull them into like a game engine if you want if you're making a video game or if you wanted to just look at them in vr um there's there's a uh a little option right down here in the in the right hand corner you just if you have a vr headset you can just click that and it puts you right in the scene and so wow um, and, and you can see they're they're all scaled so they they look about what their uh what their actual size is so um this one probably this is this one took um actually the software's gotten much better in the hardware as well so uh like my the computer i use is is very powerful uh and so i was able to do this one uh well get the majority of the rendering done in a day um i think i had a thousand images uh, used on this one wow and um you were saying that this is this this is true to size so could you do a one-to-one -one with you on the green screen and those coral there because those coral are absolutely massive right let's so. see i can i can try it uh, let me, let oh this is by the way we're no longer streaming to the to the audience on social media this is just for me uh ben please do this this is so cool <laughs> yeah this is just for us <laughs> yeah this is just for us now okay yeah. So um, let's see. I, I think it'd be about that because I, I always like have to watch out. I always bang my head on this thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and what is, is that? A, uh, what is that there behind you? This is a uh, uh, an elevator which has a camera on there. So it's hard to see. This one didn't render very well. I couldn't. We couldn't fly the vehicle in front and get good imagery uh, of it, and so it kind of broke down in the re in the reconstruction. But what this is is a camera, and so the camera is on a, a a rotator, and so basically we go and plug in, um, plug rickets into it. Uh, well, first of all, we dro we drop the in, the elevator off the ship. It sinks to the bottom. We pick it up with the robotic arm on rickets and drag it over to the the stone here, this big rock, and then um, we tried to orient it, and then they would we'd plug into rickets into it and send the video from the camera up through rickets um, and, uh, and get the position just right. And then we disconnect rickets from it and then fly away. And basically wow. it's still there. Uh, it's there for like a year. It's gonna be there for a year and at least. And then they'll, we'll, we'll drop the drop weights that are down, down here and um, uh, it'll float up to the surface and then they'll download all the images. And what they're doing is looking at this little uh this little section of sponges and coral and stuff like that but uh yeah it's th this is a big rock it's i think it was 25 meters long by 16 meters high so okay. it's pretty pretty big there's and, um and so that just, is when you're standing there next to that to that camera you picture in picture right now that's approximately how big those those coral fans are behind you yeah they, these these coral i mean i've, I've tried to uh, ask them how how old they are they're not I don't think they're really sure, but usually these coral are like hundreds of years old. Maybe Suze knows that wow. uh, better than I do, but they're, these are like ancient coral and they're huge. They're between six and nine feet tall. They're huge. Wow. Um, and so it's really interesting to, to, uh, and, and just amazing to go down and see, uh, see this and, and the amount of the, the colors that are on this rock are, are incredible too. I mean, it's just, um, I don't know. Uh, they, they really are pink like this and, uh, these uh, these sponges are are really yellow and green and it's just amazing. Yeah, really here cool. I'll I'll pull up uh, I'll pull up some footage uh, there from Davidson Seamount so people can get a little bit of an idea. And if you want me to ch chime in, um, so those pink corals they're called bubblegum corals. 
and they're also their scientific name is Paragorgia. And they, yeah, they are like the size of small trees, I always say, but they do, they can be over a hundred years old, which is amazing. And then those um, sponges, we call them Picasso sponges because of their color and just the shape. They're so beautiful. And I, I believe their scientific name is Storocalypsis. Huh. Nice. <laughs> yeah, here, uh, I'll put Ben back up on screen. You're, you've got uh, a Picasso sponge and uh, a Galathead crab walking on it right now uh, in the background. And then here, I'll put up that Davidson Seamount right. community there in the background again. Um, and you can see, oh, I mean, it looks basically like, is this the exact same rock? <laughs> it might be. Uh, wow, be. that lined up perfect just then. I'm blowing, I'm blowing my mind over here. Uh, again, sorry, everybody who's tuning in to maybe ask Ben a question, but he's ours for the time being here I, to know that with. This is amazing. I think this rock is the, um, Sir Ridge rock Sir Ridge, yeah. where they are, where they're okay. actually studying, they're doing the coral observatory. I put a link in, um, in the comments to a story about that. And then your footage that you're showing is on Davidson Seamount, but okay. both of these seamounts are within the the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Okay. That was just too cool to have both there at the same time. Let's see. Here. Oh, here. Cool <laughs> oh, cool. Here. Sorry. Let me put, let me put Ben back up and maybe, maybe, you know what, maybe we'll indulge, uh, Emily, let's go to, let's go to the audience. You know, that was amazing. Can you, can you tell us what, what do the folks want to know? Oh my gosh, there's so many things that we want to know right now, <laughs> Patrick. Um, okay, we'll 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 start with some of the ones that um that we got a little bit earlier here. Um, so Ben, are you limited in what types of sensors and hardware that you can put on the ROV? And uh, if so, what would you like ideally in a dream world love to have? on an ROV like the Dock Rickets, but haven't figured out quite how to put on there yet? Um, yeah, we, you are kind of limited in, in some ways. There's um, like every sensor you put on, has to, you have to figure out how to make it either waterproof or uh, pressure tolerant. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, our engineers do pretty well. I, I can't think of something that offhand that we haven't we've, we haven't yet been able to to do um usually if you spend enough money and put enough brain power at it like you can solve these problems but um so far we've done we've done pretty good um like what i would like to do um just because i'm a big uh, vr nerd is uh yeah there you go george put 4k camera but that's coming in october we think so we're close <laughs> um what I'd like to do is do uh, videogrammetry. So basically have a, a big setup on rickets that can, can film multiple angles of, of an object. And we can do sort of the structure from motion um, recreation stuff. But like, so we, we make a 3D model of moving objects. You know, so we, have, so we, can, we can see, we can have a 3D model of, of, a, of a fish swimming, for instance and uh, you get all sides of it. So that, that would require some really crazy like rigging and cameras all over the place. Um, but I think that's more the future. So, uh, uh, and that's, I think Kakani is kind of, kind of working in that direction too. So it'd be, it'll be fun to, to see where she goes with some of the stuff her and her team are, are working on. But um, yeah, uh, one of the things we're, we're, we're looking to do is, um, uh, well, actually we finished it. It's a VR camera. I'll pull that one up really fast. So um, this was on in um, in February, just before uh, all the COVID-19 stuff happened. And so like I just installed it. it, we just finished this camera. We just installed it. We we're getting ready to go out like the next week to go uh, do some filming and do some science. And uh, they shut everything down because of the pandemic. So uh, I had to pull this off and uh, haven't been able to get my footage yet, but uh, hopefully hopefully soon we'll get back out there and do it. But, but this you, is really cool. You've been doing a lot of VR of the squirrels in your backyard then. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
since. I, I have, well, I haven't even been able to do that. So, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> no. So it's, um, anyway, so this camera, this camera is going to be really fun, um, because it, it has two cameras that are close together. Um, so we call that interpupillary distance are really close. So they, they kind of mimic, uh, the, the human, uh, IPD. And so when, when you go, uh, what's unique about this camera is that it has a live feed. And so we can put a head a VR camera or VR headset uh, on our heads and stream the, the video source from these two cameras live to the headset. And so these are, uh, these are also um, 180 degree lenses. So um, you can, like if you sit in one perspective, you can turn your head in 180 degrees without a, a pen and tilt, for instance, in real time. Whoa. and look and see see things in 3d so we're gonna we're gonna see how that works um we're, we're also um looking at tying in telemetry overlays with that so uh some real iron man stuff you know so, <laughs> so that um there's uh we just we just had a team from ucsc uh make a really great app for us uh that that can uh tie into our vars or video annotation and RS, I can't remember what RS meant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but reference system. <laughs> reference system. I, I can never remember that. Um, it actually can tie into VARs, and you can take. Um, we're looking at using this camera to um, uh, to to uh, and calibrating it, and then you can take frames from this camera and get actual sizing, like actual good good usable sizes from wow. from. Uh, just from the, just from the imagery, so we don't need anything in the in the frame. You don't need lasers anymore. It's just it's just these. It's we're pixel matching and on the calibrated uh, known uh, kind of optical plane. So <laughs> that's that's amazing. Uh, and you mentioned Iron Man. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't offer you the opportunity to suit up as Iron Man if you oh. felt you could pull it off here live on stream. We yes. <laughs> We we also have a suggestion from Twitch that uh, as as the deep sea Iron Man, you rename yourself Tony Shark. There you go, Tony Shark. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Well done. No. So um. So if you're if that's it, you know if that's the view of you as Iron Man with with the with that, and you have the Vars the Vars system is who you would talk to, uh, in the middle. That's. That's amazing. Um, and uh, just a quick question: Would you would that replace piloting uh, from the screens for you as the pilot, or would that just be an extra tool at your disposal in case you needed it? Right now, it's an extra tool. I mean, we don't we don't really know exactly what to expect with it. Um, it's not it's never been been done uh, not with a VR headset. It's been tried with with uh, like three D TV and stuff like that, and uh, those were those weren't particularly good. They they so they made people sick. You couldn't change your perspective. It was just 3D, like one fixed perspective in 3D, which this is as well, but you can at least turn your head around and look at things. Um, and so we're looking to see how, how this can tie in. Um, when we're on bottom, for instance, this will give a natural sense of context, like in, in spatial awareness. So um, because it is in 3D, you can look around and, uh, and just, just like your brain does naturally, you can get a sense of depth from um, from how from the distance of the cameras. So, um, um, so that's what we're hoping to to try out. Um, and uh, with the, the video, the overlay stuff, uh, we can we can try try tying in like uh, not not only vehicle data but also um, kind of where like geolocation. We can have we can overlay like um, the three D models uh, in a certain area if wow. they're geolocated. We can do all kinds of really stuff. It's like the sky's the limit. So this just provides us an opportunity. Like the camera will provide sort of the backdrop uh, to all these these computer vision and nerdy uh, ner nerdy overlay things that. That's awesome. In movies. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, here, let's let's go. Uh, do you want to show us that whale model that you had up? Um, I've got oh, sure. some uh, whale fall video here. Uh, in the background uh, as well. So what can you tell us about that model that you had up a little bit earlier? Yeah, so that's Rose. This is the Rosebud whale fall. Um, this was a, a huge, huge whale. It was a fin whale um, who um, unfortunately uh, 
she was struck uh, in Southern California, just off of uh, San Diego, several years ago, and um, she was struck by a uh, like a tanker a tanker uh, ship, and it broke her back, and she ended up dying. and And I guess she washed up on a beach, and scientists found her uh, and wanted to do some science. So they they uh, they they pulled they pulled her off and w was able to sink the carcass with um, with a bunch of, of weight. So there's like seven tons of, of like steel. And, oh wow! Uh, yeah, like that's what all this stuff is. It's like it's all chain uh, and, and weights and stuff like that. So late, I think it was late last year we went down there, or maybe no, it's early this year. We went down there and um, and I was able to do a, a reconstruction of, of of rosebud. And turned out really good. There's um, so just for reference, Doc Ricketts is about as long as her head right here. Wow. So so and so this is about 12 feet long. <laughs> so uh, it was it, it was interesting flying over top of this doing during the reconstruction. Uh, I just noticed that this was the the width of our porch, like across the span here, and and the length is definitely it's about so her head is just the size of Ricketts. That's how big these creatures are just phenomenal. Um, and uh, like the vertebrae are the size of tree trunks. It's, it's insanity. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. so um, yeah, so they're doing, they're doing um, a lot of science on, on what happens to these, these, um, these carcasses when they, when they sink, they're a huge carbon transport and, and, um, and can offer food to a lot of under like deep sea communities for years and years. And like all, there's all these, worms that grow on it uh, these these um pink fuzzy uh, bone worms <laughs> so and uh you can see anemones grow on it and there's fish and they also catch a lot of trash too it was it was really depressing we saw a bunch of trash so much plastic like that's a plastic bag there was like i think we pulled we pulled like three or four mylar balloons those are those are awful so don't buy those <laughs> my suggestion yeah. We, yeah, you yeah. Want to, if you want to make sure that uh, the animals oh. uh, in the deep sea are having a happy birthday as well, yeah, balloons are. Yeah, balloons are out. See, here's, here's one of the balloons. Here, it was it was sad to see that much trash strewn about. Um, but um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry no. for the downer. Uh, no, it's 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 reality. We got to talk yeah. about it um let's see let's go to that is so cool by the way just flying around uh the website again if you are just tuning in for these uh for these models is sketchfab.com slash mbari and uh, these are free to download you'll be able to put on your vr headset if you have one and walk around rosebud the yes. whale amazing uh, let's see. Let me go to Emily for some audience questions. Uh, 45 minutes, by the way, Ben, uh, so wow. far doing, doing great on time. Uh, Emily, what do the folks want to know? Oh, uh, there's been so many questions, but, um, Ben, you mentioned that you are a self-proclaimed VR nerd. Is this something that you learned all about when you were on the job or were you a VR nerd way before? I was, I've been a, a nerd for a long time, but, um, <laughs> for sure, but, uh, no, I, um, I've, I've, I've always had an interest in, in this, uh, in, in VR. And, um, and so, uh, I've, uh, I, I've always wanted to integrate like a, like a, a VR camera and headset situation on, a, on an ROV ever since the, my competition days. And so, um, and so, this was sort of my chance. And when in like 2017, I, they, they really start coming out with like the commercialized uh, VR headsets, like the Oculus uh, Rift and things like that. And, um, and so I went out and bought one and I took a class uh, in Unity, like Unity is a game engine. And so uh, I watched a bunch of YouTube videos and, and I, I pulled in uh, one of Kakani's like larvation housings. So she gave me one of her models of uh of the larvation snot house and i pulled that into um, uh, a game world and then put um like set it up for vr so you could walk around <coughs> inside the um inside the larvation house and then like i made i made like a bazooka that shot plastic par particles because at the time she was doing 
um, plastic particle work on them to see like if they'd eat the plastic. So, um, and then we'd like, I'd take this out on the ship. I'd, I'd play around in this environment. And then like, while we're out on the ship, stick people in the headset and they could walk around the larvation and things like that. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was fun. I, I started doing that. And then I really, I, I started meeting people in the community, um, in the VR community, uh, in the nerd circles uh, that were, were looking, or that were making underwater cameras. And so um, I think it was 2018, we, we wrote, or 2019, we wrote a proposal to build one of these deep sea um, VR 180 camera systems. And it just kind of, it's kind of just grown from there, but uh, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> That's awesome. I had uh, the larvation up there behind you uh, while we were. Oh yeah. While while you were talking, uh, yeah. The, if you want to learn more about the snot palaces of the deep, everybody, you can go to Embari uh, um, or the aquarium's uh, YouTube channels, um, and that was with Kakani. Uh, so look that up. It was a really really fun episode. Lots of really cool new science and visualizations there. And uh, yeah, shout out to you, uh, Ben, for the piloting of some of those uh some of those lasers uh that's actually here i'll put here I'll oh put geez if i spotlight myself and i hide a little bit you can see the mini rov and then the laser arms and then the mucus house there of uh of the larvation this was from kakani's talk and oh yeah actually, that's the... can, can i just um chime in really quick to let you guys know that tomorrow on um tomorrow wednesday we're putting um kakani's high resolution 3d model on our youtube channel oh and awesome fly around and then it flies through and into the um mucus house and that um high resolution model is going on in bari's sketch fab as well so be sure to check it out tomorrow. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, Emily, any, any questions for, for Ben here? Yeah. Ben, would you mind talking a little bit about um, some of the different tools that we can attach to uh, the dock rickets, ROV dock rickets in order to uh, collect animals from the deep sea? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, this is what's really cool about uh, dock rickets. Um, so on my screen, I have the, the, the vehicle up, but there's this lower, this lower section here. We call this the sled, uh, the, the, the tool sled. And so we can, it takes maybe 40 minutes to unbolt these sleds on the bottom and swap them out for another sled. So uh, the, the one in this picture is called the Benthic tool sled. And we have the the desampler tray in it here. So these are called desamplers. They're basically little um, little aquariums uh, that have doors that are hydraulically actuated that close. So we'll fly along, we'll push out this tray, and then um, we'll like get an animal lined up in it and and catch it, and then close the doors. And that and then it's a self-contained um, sample. We can bring that to the surface, and they do their science on it. Um, there's also there's also like a suction uh, suction hose that's in here that goes back to uh, well we have twelve large uh, suction uh, like su suction tanks in this carousel back here and they rotate around uh, um, kind of like on a on a on a uh, chain and then uh, we have a mini sampler as well so that does I think that's eight samples so we do we can do twenty discrete suction sample, sampler samples, and then uh, we can do 12 D samples, and that's in one trip. So that's, that's, that's pretty good for, for science applications um, uh, in, in terms of catching animals uh, for science. Um, uh, we have other, other sleds that we can swap out very easily for um, like doing um, midwater stuff like, uh, or, or uh, like benthic imaging, uh, ocean imaging, um, mapping and stuff like that. So there's um, like laser, like laser um, uh, or LIDAR systems that we stick on there with multi-beam. And then there we, we can do really, these really fine um, gradient maps of, of areas. And they can do, um, it basically makes a 3D, a 3D model, 3D map of an area. It's really cool. Um, 
let's see, what else is there? Um, there's uh, uh, the VibraCore so that we can take, it's this big heavy machine that, that sits on the front of rickets and we can send, um, I think it's seven or eight feet tall um, tube cores down and, and it basically just shakes all the way down into the mud and they can do, um, they can get a, a good history of the soil in that uh, or the sediments in those areas when they do that. Um, let's see, what else? There's PIV, of course, like Kakani. Got to give her that shout out. <laughs> so we carry that thing in the arm all the time. Um, and and can, can we get it set up to uh, um, to fly on, on those larvations and, and siphonophores and stuff. It's really hard flying. <laughs> um, what else? Yeah, I mean, there's, the sky's the limit. Basically, whatever we can, if it takes Ethernet or serial or video, which pretty much everything does these days, we, we can pretty much make something to fit it. So, um, how, how difficult, uh, just as a question, how difficult is it for you as the ROV manipulator to get the USB uh, A uh, in the right way every time? Do you still have to like flip it around? I'm sorry, it's a terrible <laughs> connector joke. It's, it's always hard. Yeah, trust me. <laughs> okay. It's never easy. Never um, easy. All right. Yeah. So it's the same with the Ethernet. It always goes in upside down, right? Right. So. <laughs> well, that was awesome. I had the VibraCore going on uh, there behind you and a few other sampler bits there. Back to uh, Emily for some questions uh, yeah. from the folks. Okay. So, um, Ben, when you're on these missions that last for you know days maybe weeks out at sea how frequently do you have to do maintenance and check on all those different sensors and different sampling equipment and and all of that on the rovs oh yeah daily that's a daily thing so um fortunately like uh, there's five pilots on rickets and and uh we've we've been there we've each been there for years i've been here like eight years now so and i'm i'm the new guy still uh, compared to the other of uh, the other pilots, uh, they're all great, um, and um, they they every, so everybody knows what's happening with the vehicle all the time. It's like it's it's just second nature to us now. If something breaks down or if something needs maintenance, we just go. We 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 kind of uh, have a sixth sense about what what it's going to be. Um, but yeah, it, it's a daily thing. We we go around, we walk around the vehicle, and our eyes naturally go to the problem areas. And uh, we check we check things that need to be checked. Um, there's a before every every dive. There's a pre a pre dive process it takes about um, uh, 20 30 minutes to do. And it, we go around check all the connectors like literally every every connector because as Patrick said like the one drop can can make your day really bad. So um, so we make sure everything's tight. Um, uh, we we look for uh, oil leaks, for instance, like if the hydraulic oil is is uh, dripping out or something like that, um, we'll we'll do all these these types of checks in the morning, and then we do another set of checks uh, at night uh, when we come back on deck just to make sure uh, nothing has, had happened or loosened up um, during the dive, which can 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 happen as well. So, yeah, it, but it's a constant thing. I mean, that this it's a it is a full time job just keeping it running um, because. It's such a it's such a difficult environment to work in. Um, things change all the time, so um, yeah. And uh, if it's not too traumatic, what's the biggest thing that has broken on on a dive? I don't, I don't want to oh. make you revisit anything that's too <laughs> difficult. Uh, well, I'm an electrical guy, so it's always the, the electrical stuff is always the worst because, uh, for me at least, uh, at least in my opinion because I'm an electrical guy, but it's, uh, the, the problem with electrical problems is that they're often intermittent. And so like if something gets squeezed at, at depth and, and then breaks because of the pressure, like just because the pressure is like leaning on it or something like that, it makes a disconnect. Then, um, it's really hard to, to find where those problems are. And so, mm. yeah, like one, one time, um, me and Brian, we, we're the, me and Brian Schaefer are the two electrical techs on, on, the, on Ricketts. Um, there was a, a power supply with a connector that was that was just kind of barely like con making connection and so like on the surface it was fine but you go down a couple hundred meters and there was just enough play in, in the housing in the one atmosphere housing that it would like 
tweak the wire or something. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we'd go down a couple, a couple hundred meters and then all the lights, everything would shut off. It's like the vehicle's dead. And then we'd come back up and we'd try to restart it near the surface and it would come up. And so what we, what we had to do, we, we, like we traced the entire system out. We tried to figure out how, you know, every time we'd open up the pod, the main electronics housing and try to, to just diagnose where, where, where the problem was, like, it would shut off. So like we get out to like this spot, we'd be able to get probes in there. Okay, all right, what's the next spot? We pull out a little more, it would shut off. Oh. So we wow. started measuring, <laughs> we started measuring how far back it was that we were able to pull pull the housing before it cut out. We finally found the problem was this this one the silly little connector. Oh and man. Made the whole vehicle shut off and do you have that do you have that connector mounted on a wall somewhere like uh like you like slayed yeah. your beast basically yeah we, we actually have like a, a wall of shame it actually hangs <laughs> right above our table in, in our shop oh but yeah awesome. that, that connector is there oh wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so that's cool been the worst one for me, but yeah there's been a, a, other problems i guess on tiburon the um i guess the the bolts the the, the previous rov that was on the ship uh, I guess the bolts that kept the tool sled on, there was only one big bolt or something like that. I guess that broke off and the tool sled came up hanging, swinging beneath the vehicle. And Whoa. it was only the hydraulic lines that was keeping this whole thing on. So yeah, there was, there's been, all, there's been all kinds of crazy things that have happened, but. Wow. So far, no, not too much. Ricketts has been an awesome vehicle. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not much to look at. It's, it's kind of a hodgepodge of different technologies and, um, and, uh, and different like <laughs> designs, but uh, it is super versatile, and we've done we've done a lot with it, and I think we can do a lot more with it too. So now, uh, Ben, um, it's uh, we, we've only got a few minutes left here, uh, and so normally we'd go through some kind of like fast like round uh, of questions, but before we get to the rapid fire questions, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Gumby? hanging out there on the uh for the eagle eyed viewers you may have noticed a little green uh gentleman oh, hanging out there right there yeah <laughs> yeah what's going on there so, uh i don't really know can, can you my um the, he's a can you uh Brecky's the um chief pilot for for doc crickets uh he brought it in one day and I, i'm not really sure why <laughs> but he did <laughs> and uh he, he put it up there i i think uh, all the ROVs have had have had some mascot or another for for years. Um, I think Ventana or Ventana has olive oil from Popeye and olive oil. Yeah. And uh, and anyway, so yeah, Gumby's been with us for several years now. Uh, so a key uh, a key part of the trimming of the vehicle, right? Just like it was the only <laughs> thing that worked was this Gumby character to level everything out, right? You gotta yeah, you gotta have somebody on board. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's go to Emily here for uh, just first round here of some rapid fire All questions, right. then we'll wrap All up. Right. First rapid fire question for you, Ben. How many people, how many staff does it take to fly the dock rickets? Uh, we have five pilots, uh, two uh, mechanical guys to do hydraulics and um, welding, all that stuff, and then two electronics slash software, and then one uh, chief pilot who handles scientists. <laughs> <laughs> all nice. right question number two what is your favorite animal to find when you're on a dive in the deep sea oh uh well i'm still looking for the whale um but uh, i love i love it when sharks come up and check us out i love it when big squids come and check us out and uh and of course the vampire the vi vampire squids always fun to watch always i also like bioluminescent stuff like yeah glow in the dark <laughs> stuff is really cool all right. Uh, question number three: Has the Doc Ricketts had any hitchhikers over the years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, we get a we get a squid that comes uh, that that wants to hang on for for a while. Um, yeah, it's it's better if they let go early. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Uh, this is this is one of my favorite ones, the, the hard hitting questions that we've gotten uh, from our, our, our viewers today. Ben, what do you eat when you are at sea for <laughs> weeks or months at a time? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, we have a, a cook on board, uh, Patrick, who um, who makes uh, uh, makes us breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so he's he's got a, a menu that he he basically uh, rotates through. So um, it's pretty much the same thing every time. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, like craft macaroni and cheese sometimes, and hot dogs. But there's also um, like like lamb and uh, he, he, he likes to make lamb and um, salmon and things like that. He does a really good job with all that stuff. So. Cool. Awesome. All right. And then I have one last question uh, here for you. And it's okay if we uh, take a little bit longer to answer this one, because I think it's a really cool part of, of what you are, are doing over at Ambari. Uh, where do we get a robot like the Doc Ricketts? Oh, well, uh, you can try and do what Ambari did the first time and, and build, make your own, but uh, that's really difficult and it's hard to keep maintained. So the second time, I think they learned their lesson a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> they, they went and bought an industry one. So, so uh, Doc Ricketts is actually um, purchased from a company called uh, Soil Machine Dynamics, SMD. Um, and they, they make these for the oil and gas industry. So uh, fortunately, they, they, uh, this is not set up for oil and gas. Uh, we, we, they were, um, they built us a custom, uh, control interface with a lot of, uh, hooks for, for extra sensors and things like that. Um, and then, uh, we, we were able to go and modify it from there to make it good for science. And so, um, and it's, it's really, it's much better to do it that way because then, like SMD is handling the spares and and, uh, and upgrades and stuff like that that are that are like intrinsic to the system, like the the, the control system or the thrusters, for instance. Like they keep track of all those parts, and when something breaks, we just instead of having to go resource all those parts on our own, uh, we just go to them and say, "Hey, send us a thruster." Nice. So. Uh, and then. Uh, maybe one final question here for for you, Ben, for anyone out there who's watching uh, this right now and wanting to get into it. If there are mate competitors that, that, that are watching, what would you tell uh, someone who is watching this and really wants to get into into this world? Everything that you're saying uh, is just is just vibing with them right now. And that's like, oh, I want to like do what Ben is doing. What would you tell uh, someone who's watching uh, how, how to get into it and then what what this kind of work means to you? Oh wow! Well, um, yeah, it's the, the the job is not for the faint of heart for sure. You go out to sea for a long time away from friends and family, and it's uh, it can be tough uh, for that. Um, it's just tough to be to be on a boat. I mean, the rick or the the flyer is about the size of a basketball court. So being on the, on a boat that size with almost thirty other people for weeks at a time can be very challenging. Um, and so. Yeah, you have to be able to get along with people really well, and it's especially in high stress situations and work through problems together. Um, it's uh, um, you can't stop learning. You just you have to keep keep going, and so you have to keep driving yourself to learn and learn and learn, and um, uh, and be excited about learning. And uh, and so, yeah, it, it's it's kind of a nonstop thing. You just have to keep keep running hard. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's been it's been a really good experience for me. Uh, I'm I'm kind of that way. I need to keep working uh, and and keep running hard uh, to be happy. And so uh, this is a good job for that. Awesome. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, let's get the gallery back together. The crew is here. Uh, they've been answering your questions diligently. Um, thank you so much, Ben, first of all. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much for all of that work. Um, no <laughs> the models and everything. It's so cool. Again, sketchfab.com slash Ambari. Uh, thank you, Emily, for all of the amazing uh, questions from the, from the audience there. 
Um, and then thank you to the rest of the crew uh, that was answering questions. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, George. Thank you, Cassie, uh, so much. With that, everyone, thank you so much for, for tuning in to this Mysteries of the Deep broadcast. More of these videos are available on Mbari's YouTube channel and on our YouTube channel as well. They're also available as VOD over on Twitch. If you're watching on Twitch, hello, everybody there. Um, but thank you so much for watching, and we hope to deep see you all again very soon. Thanks, folks. Bye. <laughs> Bye.